Hello, welcome back to Fairs. Come follow me, Faithful Answers to New Testament Questions. My name is Jennifer Roach. Today we are going to talk about the Sabbath. As you know, we have been going through the Come Follow Me readings and addressing common questions that evangelicals ask about our faith that come up in the text as we go along. Our purpose is not to fuel debates with your friends or debates with strangers on the internet, but to try and help you understand where your evangelical friends or family members are coming from, why they think what they think, so that you might better be able to talk to them about your faith and how you might be able to share something that blesses them in, in our faith. So today's verse comes from Mark chapter 2. And we have, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. And as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some of the heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what's unlawful on the Sabbath? And he answered, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some of it to his companions. And then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. So a common evangelical question that comes up here is why does our church teach that we should obey the Sabbath? Clearly, when Jesus says we don't have to, it seems to them like it's kind of optional. Jesus is here saying you weren't created for this Sabbath. Sabbath is created for you. Do what you want. That's how they hear it. It's not how we hear it. Um, so let's take a look at why they understand it that way and what they're really saying. Um, so as we've talked about in some other videos, the history of the evangelical movement really goes back about 70 years at this point. And its growth happens right along with the baby boom. All right. So we're talking about really a 70 ish year old movement. Those initial churches that called themselves evangelicals, they were pretty much following the same pattern that Christian believers had followed forever. Sundays are for worship, uh, no working, no shopping, no like extravagant forms of entertainment, spend time with your family. Um, and try to keep a reverent spirit throughout the day. That's where the evangelical movement started. But by the time the late 60s roll around, things start to change. And it's a church in Southern California called Calvary Chapel that really is at the forefront of this change. And Calvary Chapel has done a lot of good in the world. This is no um, um, disrespect for them. They were a hugely successful church at that time and really became sort of the hub of the, the Jesus movement people. It's the 1970s. Um, the Jesus movement is happening with all these like hippies. Churches don't really know what to do with them. And there's this tension between like, here's these newcomers that are interested in church. And people haven't been interested in church for, for quite a while by the time the 70s roll around but they're hip, but they're hippies and they don't act like church people act and they don't dress up for church. And like, what, are, what are we going to do is, is basically the question. And, and it's Calvary Chapel who answers that, who answers that call. Um, they modify their services in a way that really welcomed the, those hippies, those flower children, those Jesus movement people. Um, this was, this started out as a traditional ish kind of church they saw a mission to reach these young people, a lot of whom had flocked to Southern California, and they wanted to figure out a way to open their doors and welcome them in. It's a beautiful story. Um, but for the most part, it's the 1970s, and most of this is happening in Southern California. And outside of California, it wasn't really as big of an issue, right? Like they weren't struggling with this in Ohio, Hello, Ohio, no, no disregard to you. But but in the 1970s, th th this was happening in Southern California mostly. So most evangelical churches across the country would have still been thinking something about the Sabbath day in kind of traditional ways. 
Their members probably pr certainly still would have been dressing up for church, men in ties, women in dresses. <laughs> but by, by the late 70s into the early 80s, what happens is um, Calvary Chapel has exploded in Southern California. They're wildly successful. They're starting satellite churches all, all over. And some of the younger leaders say, you know, they really could actually use this in Ohio, what we're doing here. We want to take this model of doing church and, and take it to other parts of the country. And that's what they did. And we're wildly successful at doing that. Um, so during the 1980s, the evangelical movement that all along since the 50s had, had kind of been more or less traditional they're hit with this wave of a new kind of church that sort of sweeps across the country where people are encouraged to um, kind of come as you are, dress as you want. Um, they really de-emphasize any rules around Sunday behavior, come in your bare feet if you want to. Um, it, the, this is the history of how they they got there, right? So starts in Southern California, it sweeps ac across the country, but why? why? Why does this happen? So ultimately, evangelicals place a very high priority on the pragmatic. Does something work? They put far less priority on other kinds of understanding of information, um, long-term consequences. D does it work? Does it accomplish the goal that we're trying to accomplish? They are highly goal-oriented. And so beginning in the, the 1980s and certainly into the 1990s, the kinds of evangelical churches that are embracing this casual style of worship are really growing. And, and it's hard by, by 1990, it's hard to find an evangelical church where people are still dressing up for church and believing that honoring the Sabbath is something that you should even care about. Families are flocking to these churches um, they have fun programs that keep teenagers engaged. There's a lot of excitement. Um, but by the 90s, certainly the 2000s, a pragmatic practice that had happened for a really good reason. Southern California, 1970s, they're trying to accommodate the Jesus people hippies, right? That's why this started. Spread across the country. Fast forward 30 years 1980, 1990, and it's a practice that no longer has a has a reason for why it was there. Let me explain that to you. Um, by by the year 2000, every evangelical church is on board with this. It becomes their entire culture, and when this shift happens, it included a shift away from the rule keeping around Sunday practices, things like you don't work on a Sunday, you don't shop on a Sunday. Nobody really saw a point in emphasizing what was reverent because embracing the casual was working for them from a very pragmatic point of view. Their churches were growing and they... I cannot overemphasize the importance that they put on the pragmatic. It was working in the in the late seventies, absolutely in the eighties, even into the nineties. There were all kinds of networks of evangelical churches that were studying models of churches of what is what is working in in a particular place. People would come from all over the country, say to Calvary Chapel in Southern California or Willow Creek in Chicago or in any number of other churches study what they were doing and just take that home and, and sort of transplant it to wherever they lived. Um, and often it it worked. It, it, it drew people in. And so they, they kept doing it. Um, by the time the 2000 gets here, the genie is out of the bottle and there's no way that genie is going back in the bottle. This is this is how evangelical churches have become. The change has happened, and that was that. Interestingly enough, this is this is a little aside. 15, 20-ish, 15 years ago, um, a movement started within the evangelical context 
of people who got interested in more um, like traditional ancient practices. Um, they wanted to have services that were quiet instead of full of rock music. They wanted to explore um, different ways of worship that weren't the kind of loud, rowdy evangelical worship. A lot of those people have since exited the evangelical world. They become they become Anglicans, Lutherans, Catholics, um, Eastern Orthodox get, gets a lot of them. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see if that happens again in the evangelical world. Anyway, um, something I something I notice in our church, our Latter Day Saint church, is that we look at evangelicals and they're they're kind of rowdier worship services and we get a little jealous. I hear this from people all the time. Don't you miss the music from, you know, such and such church? And it's true. They have exciting music. They have lots of energy. They have bands on stage and, and more. Right. And so sometimes I think a conversation like that with an evangelical friend um, would end with the Latter-day Saint saying, yeah, I kind of wish we were doing what you're doing. And I can sympathize, Latter-day Saints, with that. Our hymns are old. Organ music is not hip. It's not exciting. Even when the hymn instructs you, sung vigorously, there is very little vigor in that singing. Um, but I would like to make the case about why a more reverent style of worship is important how it sets a tone for a day where the Sabbath can be kept, that keeping the Sabbath is a blessing and not a rule that we chafe against. So when evangelicals started to dismantle this more formal style of worship, th they did it in the context of the Jesus movement and for the sake of these people who were, were put under their care, these hippies, to try and help them assimilate into this church. They did it with the very, very best of motives. But as it grew into a standard practice, as these churches kind of sweep across the country, the underlying motivation of we are doing this for other people so that other people can access the goodness of Jesus, it 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 kind of it kind of gets lost. And it gets turned into something like a person who was born and bred evangelical saying, we can follow Jesus without traditional constraints. And in fact, it's our obligation to do so. We need to show people that church is not following your grandmother's rules. It's for, it, it, we can have fun. It's for modern people. It works in, in, in the same world that you live in Monday through Saturday. We, we are going to design worship for us. Do you hear the change there? It went from, we want to change our, our worship style for the sake of these Jesus movement people into, we want to change our worship. We want this worship style because it suits us, because we like it, because it's for us, right? It, it's a subtle little shift, but it's important. Um, they wanted to make, they wanted to maintain that kind of worship so that they didn't feel old and boring and irrelevant. The goal moved from accommodating others sort of to just it being a vehicle of expressing one's own coolness. And if the point of worship is about me, and what makes me feel comfortable and that I'm able to express my coolness, my individuality, my perspective on the world, it becomes really hard to accept that anyone else, even God, should place any expectations on how that worship happens. So the idea that God gets a say in how worship goes gets tossed aside. But none of them really looked far enough into the future to say, if we start to throw out God's expectations in this area, it might become pretty easy to do it in other areas. And a really deep cynicism starts to develop of God's right to have any say 
over our behaviors and practices. If his opinion doesn't matter on Sundays, it certainly is not going to matter on Friday nights. So instead, in our church, what we are trying to say is that God asks us to have an attitude of reverence when we worship him, especially on the Sabbath day, and that attitude should be carried throughout the day. And it's true that the expression of reverence might look different in different cultures at different times, but there is no culture where failing to express reverence in at least some way is obedience to the commands of how God would like to be worshipped. God is the object of our worship. His day is Sunday. We modify our behavior to worship him as he would like, not as we would like. And so while I see what the evangelicals are trying to do, and I, it, at least historically, and it's a good thing that project ultimately fails it, it became about what makes the members of the church feel good. And when they stop feeling good at that church, they move to another one across town because they've got a better band. Oh, I sound so cynical when I say that. I don't mean it all that cynical, but the difference here is pretty stark. And it's more than just style. It's more than they're led by guitars and we're led by an organ. So that that's talking a lot about what happens Sundays in our services. But what about after church? How do evangelicals think about Sabbath keeping the rest of the rest of the day when they leave the service, Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening? And in in our church, I mean, there certainly have been some changes over time here. Some of the more strict practices of the past seem to have softened a little bit. Um if you peeked in on a Latter-day Saint family during a Sunday afternoon and an evangelical family at the same time, you might not actually see all that much difference. It's a little bit subtle, but let me tease it out for you. Um, in the last uh, roughly 10-ish years, there have been a flurry of books in the evangelical world on the topic of Sabbath. They actually care quite a bit about this topic. If you talked with an evangelical friend, chances are they have either read a book about Sabbath, their pastor has preached a series about Sabbath, they have heard about it in some way. This has been a hot topic for them. I have read many of those books. When I was in divinity school, we had a class that was just titled The Sabbath, right? And we just read books about the Sabbath. The books that have been published in the last 10 years it, they have titles roughly like finding renewal in the Sabbath or the Sabbath is the day for your soul's rest. There's one that's that's simply titled Breathe. And the thesis of most of these books is that God wants you to feel good and mentally healthy. And taking time for yourself on the Sabbath is God's plan for your mental health. Now, if you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a mental health therapist, so I am all about like good self-care and take care of yourself and, and all of these things, doing the things in your life that will bring you good mental health is not a bad pursuit. And I am certainly not criticizing it or making fun of it. You should be taking care of yourself and you do need breaks from your obligations. And that is certainly part of what Sabbath is. But is that it? Is it just self-care day? Is it just a day for me to feel better? You can hear the same logic that they use in their Sunday worship service playing out here too. This is you time, right? We're going to create a service for the kind of people that we are, right? And you get home. This is, this is time for you to rejuvenate. That is quite different from this is a day where we focus on worshiping God all day long and in various ways, even when that requires quite a bit of effort from us. Sometimes your Sunday worship might look like sitting in church meetings, committee meetings all day, doing all kinds of things, all right? That is not a self-care day. You know what I'm talking about, right? But that might be 
a way in which you are following God's command to worship him, to make that day holy. It isn't about you in that sense. Yeah, Sabbath is there for you to rest, and that is about you, but it's also more than that. The traditional understanding of keeping the Sabbath day holy was that this is God's day, and we use it for him. But for evangelicals, this has turned into, this is a day for us to feel better. So how do we explain these beliefs to an evangelical friend without their eyes just glossing over and them thinking, well, that doesn't sound very restful to me. Let me tell you what it was like for me when I first started started investigating our church. Um, it, it, I grew up in, in very typical evangelical churches, um, mostly in California, very typical for their, their day and time. And so I was used to a rock band on stage. Obviously, when you walk into a Latter-day Saint chapel, it's very different. And the external differences in worship, anybody would notice right away. But eventually, if you're paying attention, you do notice the spirit of reverence behind the differences. And they are incredibly attractive. The reverence itself is compelling. It's impossible to be both reverent and cynical. You can't do both at the same time. Those two things repel each other. And, and while it isn't true for every evangelical, my experience of what it was was a lot of cynicism and around a lot of people with a lot of cynicism because it's really hard to be cool and form worship around yourself and not get cynical about it. When you form a church to suit your own preferences, you have to edge out at least some of God's preferences and things get confusing. And it's hard to tell which of God's commandments even matter anymore. And then pretty soon you're wondering, what are we even, what are we even doing? And one way to survive that is to make a, a move into cynicism. And, and a lot of people in the evangelical world do that. I hate to tell on them, but, that, but that's just the reality. Um, not everybody's experience in the evangelical church is like that. Mine certainly was. So when I encountered a very typical kind of boring service at my local ward, it didn't take me long to see the lack of cynicism as very comforting to see the reverence as sincerity. I came to enjoy being able to worship very reverently with my friends, but also be able to have a hilarious time with those same friends in other contexts. But when we're together doing the things of God, we act like God wants us to act and we do it together. And that is a feeling of community and purpose. And there are very few feelings on the face of the earth that are better than that. And you don't get that when your church is built for your own preferences. And it's very loud and very cool and very, very cynical. Well, <laughs> there you go. I hope you have enjoyed this discussion on the Sabbath day. Join us again next week when we will look at more evangelical questions as they come up in our Come Follow Me text. I will see you then.